This is part one of a Full and Bloom interview with Mark Barner. If you'd like to be notified as more from this interview is uploaded, hit the subscribe button and click the bell. More info at fullandbloom.com. You've got a new concert DVD from Chili with Love. Yes. And then it also looks like $3 from every DVD goes to Veteran Support Foundation. That's right. That is a good foundation. I've been working with these gentlemen for years. In fact, uh, they had me come in and and uh, do a show at the 25th anniversary of the Vietnam Veterans War Memorial, which is the wall in D.C., they wanted me to just uh, to come in and sing my song, you know, because they, they took a vote and the Vietnam Veterans of America voted uh, I'm Your Captain as their most favorite song. And they got a hold of me through my manager and said, would you come in and sing your song at our uh, anniversary here? And I asked them if they were going to have a stage and, and if they were going to have PA and lights and stuff. And they said, oh, yeah, we got we got that. I said, listen, it won't cost you a cent. I will bring my whole band. We'll bring the tour bus and we'll put on a show for our brothers and sisters. And they loved it. And I'm telling you, they are genuine people. These are people who have served. There's no red tape in the organization. Nobody gets paid. All the money that they receive goes to what they are doing, and that is supporting our veterans in transitional housing, helping them uh, get the, the support that they need by advocating for them in front of the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs, and they know what they're talking about, and they get the work done. This is why we support them and thank everybody that buys a DVD for helping us to help our brothers and sisters who have risked their safety to ensure ours. Oh, no doubt. And so is it also available on like Blu-ray or any other format? At this time, no, but I have been asked and I I have a email to the guy who runs Ingram to see if there would be a chance of having a Blu-ray of this because that question has been brought up. So hopefully we will come up with one here in the near future. And then the Never and Always video, that's a song that's on there? Yes, that's one of them. There's actually two, Adam. There's a rock and roll soul video, uh, which is a bonus video, along with the Never and Always video. But the rock and roll soul video is available right now for a free download at markfarner.com if anybody wants to check out a little sneak preview of what the concert was like. And also check this video that was shot in Chile, but it looks like it was shot in California. It is Americana, Americana, Americana all the way. And we're very proud of what they've done for us. Nowadays, like when you're recording, it sounds like when I listen to it that you're using real drums on that recording. Oh, yes. Okay. You know, to me, that is uh, one of my pet peeves when I listen to stuff is that crap drum sound that's like on everybody's records <laughs> nowadays. It's, to me, so refreshing to hear real actual drums. Yes, absolutely. And the thing about the drums, uh, as long as we're talking drums, they... You know, they always play to a click track now, Adam. And when, when we were making music and all those first Grand Funk albums, uh, we were playing to the drummer, <laughs> you know? There was no click track. There was no electronic instant replay. You had to sit there and twiddle your thumbs while the, while the machine was in rewind. It took a little more time, but we didn't have all the advantages that they have now. Um, in, but I think the advantages somehow have lessen the effect because you don't have that human drummer leading the pack. you got a click track and it's everything's just like perfectly click, click, click. And I don't like that. I like the feel. I like the music that has been cut without a click track breathes. It lives and it moves. Uh, with a click track, you don't get that. And so what? You're actually, when you cut the songs, you're cutting with a drummer? Yes. Uh, what we do in the studio now, we we cut everything with a drummer because of exactly what you were talking about. Those the can drums or the electronic drums, they do not do it for me. You go into this an actual studio, cut the drums, and then do you take this stuff home and do what everybody's kind of doing with sending things around? Or how are you doing things? Do you have your own studio set up at home? 
I do have a studio set up where I can do overdubs uh, and do vocals or guitars or keyboards, whatever I need to do. But people send me things, uh, you know, files, and then and, and I put them in the DAW and, and work with them. But uh, what we like to do uh, when we're doing the real deal recording is to go into the studio and cut it like we are the band playing it on stage. Because that is really where... Uh, the rubber meets the road. And if you can pull that off, there's going to be so much more feeling in that music. And you will have the dynamic that you have when people are playing off of each other spontaneously in a room where everybody's looking at each other instead of, like you say, you know, laying down a drum track and then person goes out and puts a bass on or whatever. That's kind of, eh, that's horsey poo poo to me put the damn thing down, put that song down. And if it's got the feel, we'd take one with a mistake in it, a great big mistake if it had feel, because feel is what we're after. Are you recording your vocals at your house? I have recorded some at my house. Yeah, I've got okay. a Telefunken 47. That oh, I nice. Picked up. Yeah, I picked it up down in Detroit when uh, Ron Nevison was doing the Bosnia album. We rented some microphones for doing that, for that purpose, and... He was checking him out one day. That we had a C12 and we had that Telefunk. There was a couple of other ones up in there that we tried. And and when it got to that Telefunk, and man, I went in the in the, the control room and I listened back, and my ears went, "Ooh, man, that makes me sound like me." <laughs> that microphone right there. So I got on the the horn with vintage king actually i had the engineer there i said can you call those guys and tell them i want that microphone so i bought that microphone uh when we did that session with nevison down there for bosnia do you have a favorite mic pre nowadays well i use a demeter it's a nashville kind of a boutique uh they when they first came out they were really popular uh, I got, I still have one and use it. Uh, it's, it's a tube, uh, preamp, um, uh, and it, and it's just, uh, you know, warms it up and it doesn't give anything to it except for it breathes life into it. You know, that, that tube preamp can, uh, can really make or break it. Back in the day, like, did you have a favorite mic? Were you into Neumann's at all? Or did you have a favorite combo back, say in the seventies that you preferred to use or was it whatever the studio had? Well, I, I really like the 59s and the 87s uh, because of, the, you know, the large diaphragm and, and depending on what the song was, you can work it at, you know, getting in that, finding that sweet spot where that sweet spot is and then staying in that place for the performance. The 70s, when I look back, even though I was probably more, uh, I was a kid in the 80s, but as far as the stuff that I truly love and think is the most creative period, is that late 60s, 70s period where it wasn't so formulated. It seemed like there was more of a um, freedom when it came to writing songs. Yeah, and, and the diversity came from, you could hear it. And when you heard Canned Heat, you know, you knew that sound. When you heard Santana, you knew that sound. It was not like they were trying to pigeonhole it to fit some title that they've come up with, whether it's AOR or whatever. It was, as you say, uh, it was more diversified, I think, and that showed what state they came from, what, what the influence they were. And a lot of people are really uh, inquisitive about why there was so much good music that came out of Michigan. And I tell you, that it's because all the musicians that moved here from the South. My mother came when she was 16 years old to Flint, Michigan, and her whole family came. Uh, that was my grandpa, grandma, uh, you know, aunts and uncles. Uh, everybody came from Leechville, Arkansas, and moved to Flint, Michigan to get these high-paying auto factory jobs. And that's why there was so much good music that did come out of Michigan, because it wasn't just Flint that they settled it. There was Pontiac, there was Detroit, there was Ann Arbor, and all of the little satellite cities that had something to do, had little factories that were contributing to the big tree who had set up here and attracted all the families. Well, those families Families are still here, a lot of them. And uh, thank God for that, because that's what made Michigan, Michigan. And that's what gave us our place on the map as far as where Motown came from and where all this great music from all these great musicians that live in 
our home state. Right. Were you an MC5 fan? Oh, a big MC5 fan. You talk about a power band. Lord have mercy. <laughs> when they hit, <laughs> when they hit the stage, every head within a half a mile turned to the stage. <laughs> Kick out the jam. That's right. <laughs> Yeah.